Hello, everyone. We'll wait for a few seconds as everybody trickles into the Zoom room, the webinar room. So I'll get started now with a brief introduction of who I am and of this program, and then I'll introduce our uh, lovely and esteemed guest. Uh, today. My name is Will Schmenner. I'm the head of public programs here at the Clark. And um, every quarter, every season or so, I try to do at least one Conversations with Artists event that dovetails with the exhibition, um, often um, the, the special exhibition, sometimes with the collection. And um, and so today is that conversation. Um, so without further ado, let me just say a few words about Joe Motoriku. Um, he is a fabulous furniture designer whose work has been recently acquired by the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, and by um, the LA County Museum of Art and the Denver Museum of Art. Um, there are a few pending, um, well, there, I'm sure we'll hear more announcements um, uh, in that regard if we continue um, to listen to the news around Tariku's work. Um, he also had some of his furniture featured in the latest Black Panther movie, Wakanda Forever. And um, on top of that, he is an incredibly kind and generous person, and he's one of the easiest people I've gotten to work with um, here at the Clark in this series. So I'm I'm really feeling very, very lucky um, to welcome Jomo Tariku to this virtual event. Uh, Will, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, really appreciate this opportunity um, that uh, I'm glad you reached out on behest of the Clark. And um, I was able to watch one of the videos that uh, one of your uh, researchers did uh, this weekend. And I like the word you use, dovetail. Dovetail, in a sense, yes, as a, uh, a continuation of the presentation uh, that, uh, that was done at your museum, plus um, is one furniture technique for joints. And it is considered uh, a sign of quality when you see uh, Deftail joint. So uh, I like how that whole thing uh, came together just from your uh, Sorry about that. So um, I would encourage if uh, the audience, if you've not watched uh, this specific presentation uh, at the Clark that that is related to the, uh, the prominent uh, on paper. Um, installation that the Clark has gone and the reason I got invited and uh, I just want to do again use the that word dovetail from here uh, to my presentation what this presentation has made me reflect on is uh, obviously drawing and sketching is part of the thinking process for most of us uh, furniture designers or designers in general but I approach that from a um, slightly different angle, and I'll get into that as we progress. Um, and I've captured a couple, a few few screenshots that, that were pretty interesting for me, uh, and that was related to um, advancements in how drawings were approached. If you ask me, how do you draw? It's my sketched out pad and my pencil, but it was really interesting to learn about uh, these devices that I saw uh, while watching this specific video, uh, where it, you know this one even sounded like a holographic uh, way of seeing drawings, which I didn't know about. So that one of the reasons I enjoyed um, going to museums and I sorely miss being there uh, this weekend was to actually witness some of these things while I'm there instead of virtually. Um, um, and these were slides taken from that same presentations and illustrations that kind of uh, caught my eyes. And I'm not gonna obviously delve into this. There's a whole video on this whole thing. Uh, obviously I picked out, uh, picked on this one because it's a, it's a furniture piece. As a furniture designer was an interesting uh, 
uh, thing to to look at. Um, one thing I don't do in my designs is to actually get into the tiny details and carvings of uh, uh, other designs that I see. I tend to focus mostly on the silhouette of an object that is inspiring me. And this is totally the opposite of that. And it's just uh, an appreciation of this uh, specific drawing that I wanted to share with you. My drawings are more like this, uh, to be honest with you. It's uh, uh, a, a quick one. And, and the reason uh, I do that is because of I am the audience of of the of the drawing and i rarely share this thing and what this has given me is uh an opportunity to to show you some of my work and the way i want to proceed is feel free uh once i start uh, showing you some of my sketches uh, if you have questions and um, you want me to pause and reply or you have a question you know uh i can i can see if i can uh, accommodate you so then proceed it's a loosely organized presentation so don't feel obligated until i wrap up to say you know go back to slide number five i had a question um so put it in the chat and uh will will try to make me pause and proceed um so i want to give you a, a short introduction about me other than the biographical thing that is on my page and i want to give out a shout out to the uh, black artists and designers guild which i am one of the co-founders and members of and um, I want to respectfully ask you to uh, support organizations like this. If not for them, I probably you probably wouldn't know about my work and what I'm about to present. It is because of the uh, diligent work of organizations like this that uh, more opportunities to designers like me are happening. Uh, and obviously, it's Black History Month, so this, these two things tie together. Um, so try to find out more about other Black creatives and what we've been contributing to the culture uh, at large. And one additional thing is I come also from a data background, and this is a data research that I did on uh, Black designers that are licensed versus the general population. This is um, data that has been covered on the New York Times, uh, Architectural Digest, um, Business of Home, who did the first one. And it is still being mentioned every now and then. So the right column in, in this whole thing so is uh, showing you uh, Black designers that are licensed by large manufacturers of furniture. And I will kind of get back to that later on. Uh, like I said, I get into data and data analysis. So I'm just not a furniture designer only. Um, this is something that I'm curious about and I research and I uh, do commentaries, uh, on, especially on books related to the design canon, the serious books like the Atlas of Furniture Design and others. I wanna see if uh, representation of uh, black designers is, is there or not. And just wanna look at it just from the numbers. And the way my design style and my design thinking is all based on the continent of Africa. I did my thesis back in 1992-93 at the University of Kansas, and it was based on the idea of how can I create my own reinterpretation or interpretation of my African, connected to my African heritage, new styles of furniture but is not an exact and direct copy, but is influenced by pre-existing objects that are you know, my own ancestors or other Africans have done. And most of these objects are um, are the results of uh, craftspeople uh, that I or others don't know necessarily. We might know the region that they're from, but that's uh, about as close as we'll get to the creators of these objects. But not everything I do is based on pre-existing objects. So I, I do, you know, I get, influences from architecture, from different hairstyles, uh, clothing styles, on patterns, scarifications, anything and everything is a resource or a launch pad for me to create new designs. It's just that those uh, inspirations come from the continent of Africa. And this uh, harkens back to my idea of uh, making sure the continent of Africa, especially the sub-Saharan part, is represented in the design canon. Uh, we tend to be forgotten. Uh, people 
designers like me are uh, rarely um, profiled, and that's why I appreciate this this type of platform where I could share some of my ideas. And this is just a close up of some of the images from the previous slide. Um, and this is what I meant by, you know, architecture, landscape, you know, uh, patterns and traditional dresses, even wildlife uh, is part of uh, my vocabulary that will be used as part of my design. So this is one of my sketch pads. Uh, this is my name written in, my, in the Amharic uh, language. Uh, these are called the Giz fonts. Um, the first part is my name, Jomo, last name Tariq right there. And is one way to introduce things that you might not know about Ethiopia as a Ethiopian American. Uh, Ethiopia is one of the uh, countries that has its own uh, writing uh, text and just wanted to show you uh, that before I uh, start flipping through. So this is a kind of a selfie photo I took um, on the DC Metro while I had a, a day job. I just quit my day job come come August, I think it will be two years um, to pursue my furniture dream uh, full time. Been doing furniture for about 30 years. Uh, in between, I had stepped away from it. And this, I think, picture kind of encapsulates why I draw the way I draw and why I produce things. Um, every day I would take the DC Metro. Um, I, I do take the early one, which this one was probably around the 5, 5.30 a.m. ish um, train, which is empty. Um, so having a small sketch pad um, was handy. Obviously, you know, friends have said, why don't you use an iPad? I've tried that. It didn't work. So I, I went back to the simplest form of sketching, which is your drawing and your pencil, and I can pull it out even in a slightly busy train. But this is morning train. There's absolutely no one in the train and I'm by myself. And this was my quiet time because I had a day job and, uh, and family. This was the only time I would do ideation and come up with new ideas or pour the things that are stuck in my head out, uh, out there. And this, I really believe, is what um, resulted in me focusing on just doing thumbnail sketches and thumbnail and quick sketches. Um, this is probably the fanciest thing you'll ever see out of me, and I don't do architectural drawings. Uh, there was one project that I had, and this is this one predates actually the uh, me taking the metro train to work. Uh, this is probably from back 2004 ish, and we had one project that was supposed to be part of a hotel redesign uh, in Africa, and. For some reason, I started conceptualizing ideas. You know, why, how, what would I want it to look like? And you know, yeah, I've always been obsessed with uh, African huts, so it's a spin-off of that idea. But I'm not an architect. There's no rhyme or reason behind this. But uh, I got into this for a while, and but this is, you know, since leaving college, <laughs> probably the most decent thing I've ever done. Uh, this is my standard sketching. This is, you know, I zip through this, some of these things per page. I might even spend five to 10 minutes. The goal is not to be super duper focused on uh, one idea and spend a whole bunch of time just, uh, you know, doing the drop shadow, getting the perspective right. The audience for this thing have always been, been myself. This is just a reference for me. I don't, you know, the only people who see this is probably my wife. Uh, and uh, maybe sometimes my own, the, the couple of builders that I work with, uh, specifically David Bonhoff, who works on my chairs, sees this more than the others uh, because we do go back and forth when the construction begins of an idea um, <clears throat> in which I'll, I'll delve into. Uh, let me make sure I check time and we're okay as we go along. All right. So I'm going to start zipping through these things. Oh, one, one more thing here. And like I initially told you about inspirations, I try to jot down inspirations also as sketches instead of keeping them as photographs. I bring in photographs when I do presentation. But for me, the reference points like the huts that you see on the left side and the uh, 
the uh, water container or the jug or the the uh, the bed and so on, or the headrest that you see at the bottom left. That is how I sketch and move on because I can't carry all the books that I have in my library, and I need these reference points just to make me, sh you know, to make sure when I when I'm flipping through a few weeks down the line, I still have them. So I can say, oh, I forgot about this one. Let me uh, reprocess this again. And you're going to see, as I flip through, you're going to see repetition, rep repetitive drawings of the same ideas again and again. Uh, and that's how my brain works. You know, I, I, I keep working, reworking it until I say I've nailed it. And this guy is ready maybe for a 3D model. And then um, if... If you know, um, uh, if I have the resources to fabricate it, then proceed to that one because the biggest bottleneck for any furniture, especially independent furniture maker, is uh, the issue of resources and how much you're willing to commit to get through multiple prototypes. So I'll I'll flip through this and you'll see some of, some ideas that have been fully developed and you'll see later on in photographs. And some that are still stuck in uh, in drawing. And again, the thing I want you to pick up from my way of doing things is how tiny uh, these these drawings are. These are thumbnails on a small sketch pad. Um, and if I I don't have it right next, it's right behind me because but now I can't access it. Um, but I would have shown you. Uh, and I quickly. Uh, iterate, come up with ideas, fix it on the next pages. Sometimes multiple pages will pass. Then I'll go back and redo them. Uh, I don't care much how awful my sketches look anymore because again, I am the audience and the goal is to document and not to look this amazing drawing that I'll say, wow, I did it. Um, and if you see to the right of my uh, a slide, there is this specific chair that I, I, I've been toying around with since 2016, which is the concept of interchangeable backrests. Uh, and this is the profile of it. It looks like a lounge chair if you can locate it there. I don't, I don't know if my mouse can, is visible to you, but it's this idea that you'll see maybe multiple times. Um, and sometimes I work on joints, what kind of joints I want to create. And you, again, you can see it on the right side uh, where I am rethinking uh, a specific joint. And at the bottom left, you also see maybe how I can redesign a traditional joint and still make it uh, easy to manufacture, but have some authentic look from the in, from the David that inspired my work. Um, in, and like every designer, probably, then you're going to see notes that does not relate to the design I'm working on on the left side. Um, and, you know, that my my work tends to be very haphazard. Um, but there is some, uh, some, some process to it. Uh, some of these things that were done uh, maybe in one day. Uh, some I've skipped through and some I've gone back and forth. You won't see it here, but I, I use one of those, you know, the 3M tapes to to uh, color code and follow up. Um, and so I can, you know, even though the documentation has no dates or no nothing, but I, I know where some of my ideas are hidden. And that's how I manage back and forth. Um, you know, just to give you uh, some, uh, some uh, background. This is a chair that I'm uh, working on for 93. That's the this one right here. Uh, it says Pembe here. If you can see the on the right third page right here, that looks like a horn. Um, when I get obsessed finally and settle down on an idea, that's when uh, maybe some more detail starts uh, uh, to get included as part of the design. But if not, it is mostly what you see on the fourth page or the other pages. And again, this is the, the one on the left is the uh, uh, interchangeable backrest chair that uh, again, I've been working with, uh, working on since 2017. And uh, more of that iteration, sometimes I do it on consecutive pages so I can trace right on top of it 
um, and I also keep a very thin uh, light table to help with this. So not everything is drawn uh, from from zero or from scratch, uh, but I, I try to add to the detail as I build it up. So I have also have a bad habit of sometimes starting from the last page and going forward so I can do that. You know, I, I'm a right-handed person, so I usually draw on the right side. So some of these repetitive ones are on the right side. Um, And more more sketches and you know um, ideas of things developing. You can see uh, this is the on the left side is kind of interesting because a um, couple of the chairs were recently drawn, but I do see one of my old chairs uh, here on the left side uh, that I built that got built back in 2017. So you can see that. I don't necessarily have uh, a timeline that I follow. Uh, sometimes I even forget what the reasoning for me is to do new drawings next to something I did a while ago. It could be because I've, you know, sometimes I run, I run out of pages or I don't want to draw something further down the line. So this this is a series uh, for the for the chair, I was uh, explaining about the interchangeable backrest. So the whole idea, and I'll show you the video of the final work. Uh, a few uh, few slides down, but the whole idea behind that was, okay, now we have interchangeable backrests. Now I need patterns that I've developed for myself that I can carve onto the backrest. And that the backrest literally becomes a canvas. And the idea behind this whole design was uh, obviously there is the object that influenced it, but going forward, what I wanted to do was the backrest becomes a canvas and it becomes a, a collaborative piece where um, in the future I can I can send uh, artists and designer friends of mine or people that I've uh, been introduced to so we can collaborate on a chair where you, I give you the backrest and you get to do the carving uh, instead of me doing all the work or for designers to send their digital files and because some of the carving is done using a CNC so we can I can reproduce that if you if you design it but doesn't have the access to do the carving uh, but this was a series of patterns uh, I'm only showing you about four pages but you know it, it we I have like hundred something patterns that I've done and again the idea is this is a chair that, each one will look different by the mere fact that the backrest is always different and it incorporates some artistic uh, expression of somebody on it. And we'll, we'll get to that uh, in the photo. So the most organized drawing this days you can get out of me is something like this. And the reason I even did this is because I'm working with a specific manufacturer that would be licensing a chair out of me and I am glad they were willing to to take my drawings as is before it even got developed into a, a full full blown uh, idea or a three D model. Um, and the pretty much they selected one of these for now. Uh, and this is the three D model I did for the version they selected. It's going to be a, a stackable chair. Even when I, it kind of surprises me in this uh, presentation I watched uh, this week about the prominent uh, uh, video. Um, it made me reflect also, I'm actually kind of obsessed even when I do 3D stuff, the final rendering to be more hand-drawn than, the, so this is a drawing I sent to the client. Uh, and I could have done a 3D rendering with the right material and uh, whatever, but this is what I chose. Uh, and it was it was not intentionally done. I just said, you know what, this is, you know, I can see the shadows. I can see, you know, where the thing is coming up, uh, apart or uh, in the exploded view. And it, there's enough detail without going overboard. Uh, and I like the idea of, his, uh, of the hand-drawn feel and look. So, uh, even, and these are, uh, the, the next three drawings are, uh, also, for a presentation I did uh, for another uh, 
manufacturer. And again, uh, this this is maybe about three years old. Uh, these three and a couple of them we'll be working on for 2023. But again, I was surprised also to notice uh, this was not the first time that I sent out uh, a presentation material that looked more like a sketch than uh, a 3D rendered realistic uh, drawing. Um, in uh, For reference, I've put what inspired me to the left in my uh, my design. This this one is supposed to be either a lampshade or an incense burner uh, or a candle holder for that matter, but related to lighting. Uh, and the same thing here, this is an incense burner uh, the, in, in Ethiopia. Uh, it plays a huge role within the home, within religious uh, uh, spaces. So uh, I was looking for inspiration. Uh, again, architecture is one of those things I look after, uh, look for, and is something that uh, the 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 client, the first client who who approached me to do some work for them, wanted uh, some of the new designs that are based on that are referencing. Uh, religious uh, structures. So this these three series were done based on religious structures. And this is a cabinet uh, based on a cave church uh, found in Ethiopia also. Uh, so uh, as Will introduced me, he did mention uh, one of my uh, works ended up at the uh, at the Met. Um, and the, the, the chair they acquired was based on an Afro hair uh, pick chair. Um, and this chair to give you just a, a background because for me, these objects in a way have embedded stories in them and I'm just the current um, carrier of that story uh, for this generation and I'm passing it on. So uh, the meaning of the Afro hair pick uh, has, you know, it's always been interesting to me. It's um, obviously it is for your Afro hair, uh, but going back, and especially if you look at the photo to your right, uh, the Afro hair pick has that fist on the top uh, representing black power. This has, uh, it relates to what's been happening during civil rights movement, during what happened in Mexico with the, uh, uh, two black athletes who raised their fist uh, during the um, medal ceremony. It has with the movies that were coming out during that time where you would see black actors like uh, Richard Roundtree and Jim Kelly who would have, especially Jim Kelly would have this humongous uh, uh, Afro hair. And it was part of the whole black is beautiful movement. So it, it embeds all of this. And from, from my side where when all this was happening, obviously I was a kid in Ethiopia, but I've noticed this uh, unbeknownst to me about what was happening in the seventies in the U S uh, what I've been, I've been noticing or th all of this was being reflected in what my own uncles were doing, you know, because they were emulating things that they were seeing in the same, in the movies like shaft, uh, the way they were dressed, the way they were the hair kept, but uh, it, what what fascinates me and what makes it kind of a circular thing to me is there there are also um, ethnic groups in Ethiopia and other African uh, countries that after combing their hair with their Afro hair pick would stick it back in their hair, like you're seeing uh, the photographs to your right, uh, or like some of the uh, musicians, like uh, I think Common does that and others do a similar thing. So. That circularity uh, fascinates me. And when I presented this idea to be um, uh, during review with the Met, uh, because they were initially interested only uh, in my Niala chair, uh, then I proposed that my the Mido chair, which is this one, um, Mido is the um, uh, same as Afro hair pick in, uh, in Amharic. Um, they, they were, they okayed it and I was, surprised uh, later on when I found out what one of the reasons was because the installation or the um, uh, period room, the Afrofuturist period room that uh, Hannah Bickler from uh, Black Panther um, 
you know, stage designer who who's won the Academy Award for her design work uh, for the first one uh, was the curator uh, for the show. And um, her her vision of this period room was based on the Seneca village uh, that had a large uh, black settlement before uh, it, was, it got pushed out. Uh, and the current Met is very um, within within you know a, a close distance of where the settlement was. So uh, there's a whole thesis behind that, and I would encourage you to go to the Met uh, website to to find out about it. If you've had the opportunity to go see the period room, I uh, would encourage you also to do that. I think it will be there until uh, November of this year. Uh, but you'll see the chair that we did, which uh, that I did, uh, is part of that installation. And this was the, uh, the end result. So all that sketching, building up, whatever is to get to get me to this to the stage. My focus is I want to get uh, a really nice produced item from those little thumbnail sketches to 3D modeling. And I'll, I'll get into the technical uh, aspects of the building a little bit. But to just to go back, and I think I missed out on explaining why uh, the Met also selected this chair over my Niala chair, which is uh, based uh, or is inspired by wildlife, is because during an archaeological dig, uh, they did find two combs uh, in that settlement. And uh, again, there's always surprises in my in my 30 years journey and how things connect. And this was one of those surprises. And by the way, those two combs are are displayed as part of the period room. So you know, uh, I think I think it would be an interesting angle to, for you to discover. Um, this chair <clears throat> is made out of um, I think about 15 parts. I know it looks like is uh, it came out of a mold and it is one piece. Actually, the leg is uh, the the back leg is separate than the than the front, and it is bent using uh, multiple pieces of veneer. Like if you see the bottom right uh, drawing, that kind of explains how we built it, and that's how you see uh, the tip of the comb uh, staggered. And this is how we achieved it. We didn't try to bend. If I go back, if you see the front. Uh, of it, especially the the third picture to your right, you can kind of see that the the tips actually concave in like a, a kick in space if you're sitting there. And the way we achieved that is by staggering it and actually not bending the tips. Um, and this is actually the, you know, <clears throat> the mold was generated from a 3D drawing of the uh, Mido chair that I did that was extracted from it. Then uh, the middle picture kind of shows you the bending process for different parts of the chair. And the third one actually shows you how that one is put together. Um, and I'm going to go through a few of my inspirations and the end results of my uh, chairs and stools. For the moment, I do focus on seating. Uh, and there is a reason behind it. And if we have time, we can cover that as we get to it. Um, this chair is called the Makwami. Makwami is what you see to your left. Uh, Makwami is another religious object. It is used during, uh, it, this part actually is the carved top, but you put this on top of a staff or a, a long kind of uh, well-carved stick and you use it during um, meditation and uh, because Meditation in the Orthodox Christian Church in Ethiopia can go for hours. So this is part of what the, the deacons and uh, participants of any uh, meditation, they could be holding this. And it's a revered uh, object within the faith. So <clears throat> this, was an, this chair was inspired by that object. Uh, my designs generally tend to not to have carvings on them except one chair that I recently did. It is, you know, I I guess that's where you see my industrial design background uh, kind of kicks in. I, I usually pick up the silhouette of a shape and that's kind of where I end up. Um, it's very rare that I add more details to, to a design like 
carvings and uh, things like that. I, I rarely do that. Um, this is based on a water jug, again, uh, found in different parts of African countries. Uh, many Sub-Saharan and uh, Sahel countries actually have them. Uh, specifically, the one I based one is out of Ethiopia, which, uh, which is used for carrying water uh, long distance. And uh, <clears throat> on the back of uh, mostly women and young girls, uh, this is a back-breaking process. Uh, it is something uh, I, as part of my storytelling, is something I want to incorporate in the future. Where I don't even I don't only tell you about what I do with the inspiration, but I want to tell you more uh, about the objects that inspired it. So this would be um, hopefully an ongoing conversation that I'll I'll make part of a, a future installation uh, or a solo show. Uh, this is this chair is called the Niala chair that I had mentioned earlier. This one uh, was inspired by the Niala antelope that has this uh, beautiful uh, horn. The male the male Niala has this specific, uh, and and they do grow very large. But the antelope plus the horn, uh, but it's it's also one of those ideas uh, that have kind of played or toyed around for a long time. You know. How okay? I like this shape. I love the silhouette. But how do how does that transition into uh, a sitting? Not necessarily even a chair, but you know, uh, multiple sketches and iterations is what uh, made me derive this specific shape. Um, I also have a, a um, an obsession with three legged chairs because that's that's what I kind of grew up with. There are. Uh, three-legged stools all over Ethiopia uh, in other African countries as well. Uh, and that has left, uh, I think, a permanent imprint in my uh, design vocabulary. Um, mostly I move away from three-legged approaches when, you know, sometimes the design doesn't work, uh, but I think it worked perfectly here. Um, in our, these are additional photos from using different materials. The, this one is made out of ash. Uh, the previous one was walnut. Um, this is a design uh, based out of the Ashanti stool from Ghana. In like I mentioned earlier, and this is where my industrial design side also kicks in. This my version is height adjustable, and as you can see, uh, you know, if I show my the right photograph without any reference to uh, most West African or Ghanaians that pick up right away where I got the influence. And I like that kind of connection where uh, if you know the specific object that influenced it, can you make the connection? No, it's not a necessity, but I like to have that conversation with people that have interacted with my design. <clears throat> but you know, for the larger audience, I wanna show you and I wanna also be able to tell you, look, I get the inspiration from a shanti stool and I'm gonna call mine a shanti stool. And I'm not gonna try to hide the fact what influenced my work. I want you to see my work and hopefully if you don't know about the origin of my design, you'll be curious enough to dig deeper. Like I said initially, there are stories embedded in the original shanti stool and I'm embedding my story, my interpretation into mine. And I hope that gets carried over into the next generation of designers that are uh, working on their own. They'll say, okay, this was Jomo. Jomo lives or comes from a country that's not even uh, in any close proximity of Ghana, but he uses you know, African elements for design. Is it something I can emulate to? This is this also to even uh, young black designers these days. I want people, I want African and black designers to use their own heritage as a reference point and do their own reinterpretation. This should be one of the tools you should have in your uh, in your um, toolbox. Uh, again, this is this, the, the, the one on the left is called Berjuma. Berjuma is a, the, the stool I was telling you a few few minutes ago about that I grew up with. These three-legged stools are literally in every home uh, within Ethiopia, uh, uh, the, in, uh, I grew up sketching this thing out of boredom, uh, when I was, when I was a kid to later on get into furniture design unbeknownst to me. But, uh, again, I look at 
objects like this and say, all right, I, you know, I, I can do a machined version of this that's much cleaner, but can I take the silhouette of this shape and do a reinterpretation of this? So the one on the right is a 3D rendering. Uh, it's not like I don't like 3D renderings, it's just that it takes too much of a time uh, and I, I rarely do them these days. My idea is to sketch, get a, a 3D model, not necessarily even rendered, but if it is a presentation like this and I need it, I'll do some kind of a rendering. Uh, or if need be, if there is a, a client that is asking um, a spin-off of you know, a pre-existing object in a different color, then I might do that. Um, but um, I just want to mention that all my work in all my work, there is a transition to 3D modeling before a build is done, but not everything goes through a 3D modeling process. Um, this is a chair based on the uh, uh, birthing chair that are found in different parts of Africa. And this is what, this was the first series of chairs I did where the whole idea of the interchangeable backrest came. So the the birthing chair, if you pull out the seat, the whole chair comes, you know, comes apart. There's, you know, uh, it's flat. It's gonna, it, it turns out like a flat pack looking uh, piece of furniture. So what I did on my, on my redesign is I flipped around the whole idea. So now the seat is static and the backrest you can pull out. And this was done for a, a show that I participated in, uh, in Venice, uh, in Dubai. Uh, so that's where uh, I started um, experimenting with this idea on how far to take it. And I'll show you the latest updated version that we just showed at Design Miami uh, at the Wexler booth uh, later on. And these are different iterations, just like the sketches. Uh, when I have time, I, I used to play around with the whole 3D. Again, here, the first the first uh, screen is more sketchy or uh, hand-drawn than the last two. Um, and this is the uh, my latest inspiration, which when I started the first version back in 2017 of the whole interchangeable backrest, I didn't know about this chair. Uh, this chair is something I I discovered about. I was surprised actually. It did this specific chair is out of Ethiopia, and me being from Ethiopia, I've never noticed it or have seen it before. Uh, and I really got locked into this. I said there has to be a reinterpretation of this chair I can do. Uh, because it was already part of that uh, experimentation on this whole idea of having more than one backrest to it. And um, this is the video. Hopefully, let me make sure the audio is not too loud and uh, doesn't come through. But uh, this was a video I did for um, Instagram just to explain the process or my thinking process. There's always research is a huge component on my side. Uh, be it buying books on uh, on these other on these various inspirations, and just flipping through them when I have time. And as you can see, before I hit the play button, you can see how many tabs that I have just inside this one book uh, at the top, and on the right you see all the blue, pink, yellow tabs. Those are uh, and some I label because I like it so much. I want to say I need to get to that one first before. I flipped through these other ones. So let me play this video quickly. And uh, so this is, this day is probably as far as it can get me when it comes to using even marker for a sketch. Um, so this was the chair design I came up with. Um, it's, it's made out of bent veneer, ash veneer. And it uses the backrest, the spare backrest as totems, and they can. the The video will proceed to showing you what happens when you change the backrest, and you can flip them around to get a different design. I'll let it play through so you can see. Um, I created four different backrests with front and back different colors. The orange and red on the video they look the same, but uh, front and back, they're actually different. And this was uh, recently acquired by a museum, but I can, uh, we'll announce it uh, in the 
hopefully in the coming month. And again, going back to you know the sketch look and why you know unbeknownst to me, I guess uh, I'm still obsessed with what kind of rendering uh, modern softwares give you. Uh, again, I again default to something that looks like it was made using charcoal. Uh, and this is the Quanta uh, totem chair. Uh, you know, this uh, this chair design is a combination of both what a totem is and uh, and what a, a you know that specific chair I showed you is so it's a merger of those two, and it is named after that. Um, I'll go back to inspiration. This is I don't have the final product of uh, this one, but it's a three D rendering. The the one on the left is a Zulu hut, and this is uh, was something that was inspired by that. The whole uh, again architecture playing influence into uh, the type of uh, stool that I've designed, and this is another version. Uh, of the same thing. Uh, this is called the Mukacha, and it is a merger of these two ideas uh, of the um, Astol and uh, the, the specific Benin, uh, Benin uh, bronze uh, sculpture. And the, the neck ring is, you know, is emulated on that stool uh, and is a combination. Again, sometimes it is not a direct translation of only one object, but is a merger of uh, multiple objects. And this one and the, the Quanta totem chair is a result of that one. This is one of my oldest works and just, uh, uh, again, based on traditional uh, Ethiopian stools. But this, these ones were uh, uh, four-legged. Uh, this one is called uh, Kabaro. Kabaro is the traditional drum uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, and it is the, the top actually opens. And this was just uh, the prototyping process. It's made out of stacked plywood. The, in the interior is hollowed out uh, for a couple of reasons. One is to reduce weight because these things are extremely heavy. And uh, the second is if you just want to throw in a couple of things while you're tidying up your house and hide it, you're more than welcome to use that uh, empty space, obviously. And the top is hollowed out um, so you can easily uh, lift it up. Uh, this was one project uh, that spun off multiple ideas. I showed you the Shanti stool earlier, but this was the very first one I did. And to your left is what you're seeing is a very small headrest. Uh, it's called the Burrati. And it is this type of shape is actually found throughout uh, um, Sub-Saharan Africa. And I I looked at, that, at this shape and I said, look, I can easily blow it up to the size where you can sit on it, or I can experiment and see, again, redefine it from my perspective as an industrial designer. And this was the very first piece I did where uh, height adjustability or ergonomics got included into it. It's like, okay, it's a short stool, but can we, can I incorporate height uh, um, where you can raise the the seat by a few inches to, you know, if you're using it as a, as a, um, you know, people have been using it to put books on it when they're sitting next to a couch, or if you want to sit on it and you just want to raise it a little bit because you're a bit taller. Uh, I came up with a simple system where you can pull out the pin and uh, move it higher. Uh, and it is made out of plywood. The exercise behind this uh, seat is um, my kind of was a, uh, the reason is my brother, my younger brother, who said, everything you're doing ends up being expensive because you make them too intricate to build. And this was one where we said, let's let's do it digitally fabricated because it's cut using CNC piece, one where I can do the building in my own small shop. Uh, and two, it is it could be made to order uh, quickly. Um, Unfortunately, that's not what happened. <laughs> uh, they made the one being the the specific type of plywood we use uh, mostly comes from Russia, and there is shortage of that uh, plywood. And uh, digital fabrication is not uh, as um, uh, cheap as everybody thinks it is. Um, and the combination of that and finishing has made it a little bit pricier than we expected. But the, it was a worthy exercise because this is the first idea I came up with. And this kind of shows you how how the each piece is cut 
uh, the seat is actually cut out of the uh, outside perimeter of the designed object. Um, and that's how we uh, try to reduce waste uh, while doing this and try to make it as economical as possible. Um, and this is just to show you the CAD drawings involved. So there is no 3D rendering of this thing. It was like, okay, I like this idea, time to prototype, do the CAD drawings and move on. Um, and this is how many we can cut from one five by five sheet. And that's a whole stool. And this is for the doggone uh, version of the uh, stool. And you can kind of see the inside of um, what, the, you know, if you cut the stool in half, this is what you'd see. You'll see all the alignment tabs and how the whole thing is put together. Um, let me quickly check time. All right. Uh, we're almost uh, at the end. And this is the Ashanti version that I showed you earlier. Uh, this is my small shop, which I produce these things. This is actually uh, me producing the 12 pieces that were needed for uh, Black Panther, the movie. Uh, and I think this is a quick video of me putting one together so you can see. So it's pretty much like a layered cake. Uh, you put these things together, uh, you staple it, you clamp it, you let it dry, you pick the next one and you do the sanding work and so on and you keep going. I was doing this at night while I had a, a day job at that uh, at that moment. Where you can find my work, you can definitely go to jomofurniture.com and jomotariku.com is my shopping cart. Those uh, the items to your right are available for sale. Um, Jomo Furniture has some items that my two galleries carry. Uh, same stools could be found at MoMA Design Store. Uh, this, these are the, the four items we showed at uh, Design Miami through Wexler Gallery um, and Foreign Agent Gallery out of Switzerland uh, is also one of my reps and in Europe, uh, they've been doing a fantastic job. You can check them out too. Uh, what's in the works? Um, well, uh, this is where my items were part of the design of the Black Panther. They're really hard to see. So uh, I kind of indicated in the first image to your left where they are. Uh, also, it's a very fast paced um, a movie. And I think you can, let me see, uh, quickly play this video and we can, um, so that's the blue screen in the background. They've also incorporated some uh, other African themes throughout. I uh, have no involvement in that one, uh, but these were the stools that I was making in my shop that you saw that they ended up painting to their to their uh, preferences and situating them everywhere. They ended up using fourteen items, twelve of my stool, thirteen of my stools, and one of my chairs. Um, and this is one scene uh, that that has my chair and stool, but it's kind of hard to see again because. Um, one of the actresses sitting on it and it's in the background with people. Um, 2023 and forward. So I'll keep working on changing the design canon. That's one of the goals at the Guild and of myself as a data researcher and somebody who's uh, an astute studier of, the, uh, uh, of, the, of our field. Uh, we are in the process of establishing a shop plus studio outside of that small shop that I just showed you. Uh, and the goal is to incorporate an educational design lab where, where hopefully we'll make uh, the DMV, the DC, Virginia, Maryland area, uh, the design center, just like uh, hopefully like New York and Philly and uh, other cities. Uh, right now, I don't find DC to be very design centric. Uh, also, we're planning solo shot Wexler. Uh, obviously, like I said, with the backrests and everything earlier, I want to collaborate with other artists and designers. Um, definitely strengthen relationship with Africa. I'm based out of Springfield, Virginia, and I sometimes tend to get uh, focused on what I'm doing at the U.S. just by the amount of work I have to do and because of family. But the, the goal is to keep doing work with other African artists, and I'm working with one at the moment, actually two of them, and hopefully we'll see the fruits of that end of this year. And more research to come up with uh, new ideas, new thinking, new approaches. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Jomo. Um, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to talk so frankly sure. about your design process mm -hmm. um, and showing us all um, the sort of behind the scenes imagery. Excellent. I wanted Thank to you. reach out. Oh, uh, any, uh, I wanted to reach out and see if there are any questions. You can type them in the in the Q and A box, or you could also just raise your hand within the within the participant um, box, and I um, and you could ask your question in person. Uh, I was going to start us off just by asking you, Jomo. Sure. You you alluded that you really like working on, or you have gravitated towards working on chairs and stools. Mm -hmm. Why, why is, is there a reason for that, that you? Yes, there is actually a good justification for it. Um, around DC area, and most of us live in a townhouse. I'm one of those. I, I have a small shop and a, I am based right now out of my own basement. So the idea of doing um, large tables and cabinets is out of the question. Um, <clears throat> well, obviously, if somebody has commissioned it and I've been commissioned to do a table uh, uh, previously, and the moment we got the table done, we shipped it straight from the shop. I didn't want it coming into my space for a photo shoot or anything. Um, because it could easily get damaged. Uh, the, the space is tight and um, stools and chairs though fit in. I know I've blurred my background, but I do have, I mean, the, the floor, this is my living room and it's full of uh, prototypes too. And, you know, you go through five or six of these things sometimes. Um, so those are manageable within the small space I have. So uh, that's the reasoning behind it and not because I have any and uh, the test to towards other furniture pieces. Um, on the flip side, though, I, I still find figuring out, especially a chair, uh, extremely difficult uh, and a challenge. I think most of us furniture designers uh, would like to come to that challenge and see if we can respond to it. So it's not only figuring out the ergonomics, but can you still make it look like an interesting piece? And can it do both? Could it be really a functional art piece? Uh, and it's not easy, I, I'll be honest with you. Um, but there's nothing um, as good as feeling when you design something and you think you got it right. And that's what I feel about my Niala chair. And you know, um, I, I think probably people who do sculpture do this. Uh, and you know, I can consider, I guess, pieces like that as a sculptural piece. Because I would just go around it and look at it and say, oh, I love how it looks from this angle and this angle and this angle. And I'll say, you know what? I've nailed it. I got it right. Um, so there is that aspect of it too, um, you know, raising to the challenge of designing an interesting uh, chair uh, and getting it right, at least from my perspective. You know, other people might not think like that, but. Uh, well, I've heard other designers say, or other furniture designers say that the, the chair presents a mm -hmm. set of challenges that they find really um, rewarding and yes, um, I agree. elegant, you know, yes. and and the wear form and function meet with chairs is mm -hmm. uh, its own. I agree. Yeah, its own, its own. I don't know, animal. Maybe <laughs> I don't know what the right. I use an right animal for is. design too, so be careful. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the other question I had for you is just about. Um, Drawing is drawing for you a way of thinking. It yeah. seems like your mind is at work when you're reiterating your drawings again and again. Yes, I, I find it. You know, maybe the current generation can somehow sketch fast on an iPad and go through things uh, quickly, or even on a computer. Um, who's a drawing? And I, I have these tools. You know, it's not that I don't have it. It's just that I. This is. What I did when I went through school, I didn't have these tools. The tools I know is a paper and pencil. And that's what I grew up with. The only thing I changed, like I mentioned earlier, was just spending too much time on one drawing. For me, like you said, is a thinking process. And the more I do, sometimes I, I literally sketch the same thing five times. Mm -hmm. 
I am trying to see if I could just change one line and uh, the aha moment will come, you know, and, and it works. Sometimes it, the, you know, things click because you just keep doing five, 10 versions of the same thing again and again and again, and something will pop into your head. Or like I said uh, in an earlier, um, uh, you know, slide, you end up merging it with another thing that has interested in you. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's one way to to think, one way to develop a design vocabulary for yourself so you can go back and look at them down the line. Um, so the only negative things that I, you know, I, I want I want future designers to avoid is uh, not to be as haphazard as I am, you know, where I tend to draw things everywhere. Then, you know, as of late now, museums are interested in my work. I, I'm even having a hard time dating some of my work. Because, you know, it, some could be 10 years old and I'll think it's only seven mm -hmm. uh, because I'm finding it next to something that I did, you know, seven years ago. Mm -hmm. But it's like you said, one drawing that had the Niala and something else. The chair next to the Niala was drawn uh, maybe two months ago. But then that Niala chair was probably drawn 2016 or 17. Mm -hmm. So, you know, can you date it? Can you catalog better? Especially if your goal is like, hey, I'm I'm gonna pursue a serious career through this, and at some stage my work is gonna end up in a collection of either a serious collector or a museum. And when this, you know, for me it was a new experience. I didn't know people were gonna ask when I designed something, what was my all of this because I've never had this experience until mm -hmm. you know a, a year and something ago. The, when the whole interest in my work uh, showed up and I'd say, oh boy, I should have done a, a better job cataloging my work. You know, well, it's, it's, It sounds to me uh, like your haphazard approach has worked just fine. It's yeah. got you where you are today. <laughs> yes. <laughs> For the end product, it has. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think um, that relationship between like discovery and imagination and mm -hmm. haphazardness is is a tough one for us to sort out yes i'm sure a lot of artists and uh, designers or people in the creative field probably struggle with this um it's just that uh, looking back i find it a bit annoying for myself and it's just like can i give somebody a heads up not to repeat this because this is not it's not helping yeah in that's, some aspects i guess yeah that's really that's very generous of yeah. you well i um Thank you so much. I'm, I'm just going to ask one more time if anyone in the audience has any questions, feel free to type your question in or raise your hand. Um, but otherwise, we'll, uh, you know, we've recorded this and we'll make sure to post it so that people cool. in the future who are interested in your work, Jomo, can, can come to the Clark's website and hear you speak about things as they stood in February mm -hmm. 2023. Mm -hmm. We'll put the date on it for you. Thank you so much, uh, Will, and thank you for uh, everybody uh, who was behind uh, putting this together and uh, giving me this platform to talk about my work. I enjoyed it. Well, it was it was our pleasure. Um, thanks to everyone for being here virtually today, and um, wherever you are, please stay warm. Yeah. Thank you for listening. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>